welcome aboard to MLB This Week. It's the MLB This Week show for July 27th, 2014. It's the Hall of Fame weekend show. My name is Rich. And I'm Gary Mack. And welcome aboard to this edition of uh, the weekly show where we talk all about baseball and the happenings around the league, around the world, and everything baseball. And Gary, we had quite a week that just ended uh, tonight on uh, Hall of Fame induction day. Oh, we sure did, Rich. And uh, as you say, big day today with the Hall of Fame induction and uh, uh, really a big and a fine class going in. Yeah, it's uh, quite a contrast from last year when practically nobody went into the Hall of Fame. And, uh, of course, it was the first year for a lot of the steroids uh, gang that were supposed to make it into the Hall of Fame very easily. And none of those players made it in. And uh, this year we had a couple of Braves and Frank Thomas, uh, a couple of managers, Bobby Cox, Tony La Russa, and Joe Torre, all into the Hall of Fame. So it was a nice weekend, and I'm glad they uh, came to their senses this year. And last year it was sort of like a, a blanket was thrown on the Hall of Fame there with uh, hardly anybody going into the Hall. Yeah, they have to really improve it to, to somehow to get get more members and do something more like football does. Uh, it, it, it just you, you want to see some people go in, and I know the steroids was a big part of that. But uh, it was, uh, like you said, last year was kind of disappointing. Yeah, and uh, I saw an interview uh, just this past week with uh, Pete Rose, and actually, uh, to build upon the story from what we were talking about last week, he is supposed to be taking part in some fashion in the 2015 All-Star Game, which is going to be held in Cincinnati. And uh, it was a heartfelt interview from Pete Rose. He, he was talking about how badly he was tugged around with the baseball uh, situation, where he can be on the field sometimes in some fashion uh, when baseball allows it. And other times he's not allowed even near a field, uh, but he was very upset and very emotional. And you know, he, he basically is saying, if you're going to let me back for a few events, why not let me back into baseball, and why not let me back into the Hall of Fame before he dies? And of course, uh, he's up there in years now, and it was really a, a heartfelt interview from a guy that's been uh, pretty tough over the years. Yeah. Uh problem is, you know, it was kind of his own doing, and uh, don't get me wrong, I think he should be back in the game. I think he served his time as it was, but uh, it was his fault, and we have to keep that in mind, and he probably could have got back in a lot sooner if he had come clean years ago, but by the, he kept denying it, and then finally came came time when he, he uh uh, you know, uh, said that he did gamble on baseball, and I guess that's a bigger crime than steroids, and they're going to hold him to it. But uh, it's really a shame. The hit leader should be in the Hall of Fame, should be involved in baseball, and maybe with the next commissioner, or maybe C League when he uh, exits, will uh, pardon him and allow him back to take part. You know, they could partially pardon him where he could take part in things. But he's not allowed to manage a coach, and if that's what they're worried about, then uh, I, I think that's easily uh, rectified. Yeah, and I think uh, with all his accomplishments as a player, uh, it is kind of tough to keep him out of the hall when he's got so many records, and he was such a big part of baseball when he was playing the game. And I don't know if they should hold him that accountable since he was a manager. Yes, he was in baseball. No, he shouldn't have been gambling. Uh, it is a no-no, and baseball frowns upon it tremendously. Uh, as I've had talks with several big league players, of course, I've never been in a major league clubhouse before, but they tell me all that in every major league clubhouse, that motto is prominently displayed for everybody to read. And that's, it's a bad thing, and uh, something that, I don't know. I, I really don't think uh, with this current commissioner that he's going to do this for uh, Pete Rose, but you never know. They, they might have a change of heart. Yeah, you never know. And uh, uh, just think about it, though. He's only the one in our lifetime of watching the sport 
that that you've heard about really that's gotten caught uh, doing such a thing. So it, I, I don't know if it's it, it's not a prevalent thing. It probably was more prevalent years ago. And look, there's guys in the Hall of Fame that you know bet on games. I mean, Tris Speaker was a big uh, uh, gambler. Ty Cobb was he gambled and he was kind of a racist and everything else. So. It's not all great character guys in the Hall of Fame. Uh, the difference is that Rose got caught. He got caught red-handed. He didn't admit to it. And uh, he had sort of a vindictive uh, commissioner, if you will, in at the time who wanted to going to make an example of him. And uh, uh, it, it's just uh, it, it's a shame. It's a shame that it all happened the way it did. And I still think that if they never found any evidence that he bet against his team, uh, from all I've read and heard, he always bet for them. Yeah. Well, I don't get the big deal then, in a way, because that you know, how is he going to affect? You know, the whole thing is well, he could affect the game by taking out a pitch. Well, but he's going to affect the game to win the game. <laughs> so. Yeah. And exactly. isn't that what he's got to do anyway as a manager? Absolutely. So, I don't know. We'll have to keep an eye on that story. It's been one that's been dragging along for years now. And, of course, uh, P. Rose finally uh, he said he's up to his eyebrows in, you know, appearing for baseball, coming back, uh, being somewhat, uh, you know, respiteful for it and uh, trying to be respectful to the game now. So we'll have to see... Uh, what happens, but in other news, uh, also centered around the Hall of Fame, uh, Tony La Russa, who was inducted to the Hall of Fame uh, just today on uh, July 27th, actually came out and supported the steroid era players, including Barry Bonds, Roger Clemens, and Mark McGuire. Of course, he used to play for La Russa uh, for many years with the Cardinals, and uh, he came right out and endorsed them and told uh, writers and anybody who would listen that he believes that they should be entering the Hall of Fame even with or without an asterisk attached to their name. Well, we discussed this a little bit last week, and, and you know, I mean, you still have to have the hand and eye coordination and hit the ball. So I, I, I really don't see it. I think they're going to have to make that commitment. You can't take a whole generation of players and say, okay, well, they're not going in because they took drugs. Everybody knows it was a certain era that they took some of these steroids. And again, what is a performance-enhancing drug? I mean, you could really make an an argument that uh, Advil is a performance-enhancing drug or uh, 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 Ben Gay or Icy Hot is a performance-enhancing drug because it helps you, you know, if you've got a, a... uh, a soreness and, and you rub that stuff on and it loosens up the muscles or if you take an anvil and it helps then uh, you know uh, that could be considered as uh, uh, performance enhancing drugs I guess I mean I don't know but I yeah. think they're going to have to make that, that decision somewhere along the line and I think they're going to have to go in well I, I... This is one where I would kind of disagree with that because all of these quote-unquote steroid era players for the most part have denied that they've been uh, using steroids. Mark McGuire, he made a limited confession in 2010 uh, only after it was brought out for many years that this has occurred. Uh, Different players, uh, Roger Clemens uh, on up to uh, some current players still in the league uh, still dispute that they ever took anything. Barry Bonds is still somewhat in denial. They haven't come out and said, yes, we've done this, we're sorry, we didn't want to do it, but we did it anyway, uh, sort of thing. So it's a double standard on that end where they're they're not admitting that they aided themselves with the use of steroids, and really it gave them like superhuman powers. There's no way they would have been able to do the things that they did without taking those steroids. So... I don't know. But then again, Rich, they never failed the drug test either. So we don't, as far as we know, because they never released all that Mitchell report. Now, that's the same thing that that some guys, they didn't vote 
for Mike Piazza to be in the Hall of Fame because they said he had acne on his back, and that's a clear sign of using steroids. But he claims in his, his biography he's had acne on his back. He's had a problem since he was 12 or 13 years old. So, you know, uh, he's missed out now two years in a very close vote, and, and maybe because some writers felt that he did take it. But he never failed the drug test. Uh, as much as I, I hate Roger Clemens, he never got caught, never failed a drug test. Uh, I mean, he even beat a, a congressional uh, federal court. He won a case. So, I mean, if, if Mark McGuire never failed a drug test, as far as we know, uh, Sammy Sosa never failed a drug test, how they can make the argument, well, yeah, I never did take it, and here's my proof. And, uh, I mean, A-Rod never failed a drug test, but A-Rod got caught with with so many other, there was so much other evidence against him. Uh, but these guys, you don't hear anything about. Big Poppy, what about him? He was supposedly in that Mitchell report. Uh -huh. I just think that if you guys, there's no, unless they got concrete evidence, they can't keep them out. And, and I think these writers that go on because a guy's got acne, I don't think it's fair. Well, we'll have to see how this plays out. Obviously, the writers so far have have ignored the steroid gang. They have not made it in. And actually, that leads us into our next story, which this week, of course, is very focused on uh, the Hall of Fame. We're running stories right down for everybody that's listening. Uh, just in the past couple days, Gary, the uh, Hall of Fame voted to limit the amount of years that a player is qualified to enter the Hall of Fame from 15 years, what it had been currently for the past many years, down to 10 years. So that affects some of these players that were uh, embroiled in the uh, steroid era as well. And that sort of uh, changes the game for some of them as well. And and don't think that's not the reason they did it. Uh you know, and the only thing I'll say to that is, uh, don't forget that after that it go they go to a veterans committee, and as these uh, players that played in that era that was so called clean, because we don't know if anybody was clean really, um, as they get on the veterans committee, they're liable to put these buddies, their friends in, or or, or guys. Uh, you know, uh, that they played against because they know what hard-nosed play is. And again, you have to have a certain amount of talent. When you look at the uh, the number of guys that they suspended last year with the uh, Balco, whatever it was, the uh, scandal at the end of the year, really, the big names on there were Ryan Braun, maybe Jenny Peralta, A-Rod. But how many other guys were there that never made it? You know what I mean? There were some yeah. minor leagues on the list. And um, you hear about minor leaguers that ha that are that failed drug tests, and then you look at their numbers, and their numbers aren't that good. So, yes, they try to do something to thinking that it's going to help them get to the majors. But a lot of times they don't have the total talent in the beginning to start with. So does it help? Uh, I mean, was Barry Bonds going to be a... a a uh, uh, Hall of Fame player. I think he was on his way to it. He may not have hit 73 home runs or 75, whatever he hit the season. He may not have broke uh, Hank Aaron's record. But yeah, he still may have had enough, you know, 3,000 hits and everything to get to the 500 home runs to get to the Hall of Fame. So uh -huh. it's, it's, uh, it's a tough call. And, of course, as you said, Mike Piazza was edged out. It was only his second year on the ballot, so he's got uh, roughly seven more votes to go. Uh, he finished in fifth place this year right behind Craig Bizio. So uh, assuming there's not a big collection of players that are going to be shoo-ins for the Hall of Fame in 2015, there's maybe your likely candidate uh, for next year, both Bizio and Piazza ranked right below the Hall of Famers. 
So I think maybe you see them elected to the Hall of Fame uh, next year, and even maybe a Jeff Bagwell might get in. But uh, I don't think even next year you're going to see a lot of these writers change their minds about the uh, steroid gang. Uh, they just finished too far below in the balloting this year. And, of course, the people that vote these guys into the Hall of Fame are the Baseball Writers uh, Association. And I just don't see them all changing their minds uh, about this. But we'll have to keep an eye on it for you. And we're going to talk object objectively about it all. All year long, we're going to feature uh, items like this, so we hope you like this uh, banner back and forth about the Hall of Fame. And Gary, we're going to switch gears here, and we have a story that you uh, uncovered this week out of uh, MLB and the Kobe Lewis. Is he an idiot? <laughs> well, Rich, <laughs> uh, all the evidence seems to point that way. <laughs> Uh, in one of the controversial parts of the season, Texas Rangers pitcher criticized the Toronto Blues outfielder Colby Rasmus for getting a hit off of him in the fifth inning of a game, and this took place last Saturday. The Rangers were playing the shift against Rasmus, meaning that they had the three players on the right side of the infield and just one on the left side of the infield. So Rasmus smartly laid down a bunt towards third base and got a hit. That's the way you beat the shift. Mm -hmm. Well, Lewis didn't like that. He thought it was unethical. He said, uh, you're up by two runs with two outs, and you laid down a butt. I don't think that's the way the game should be played. Well, I couldn't disagree with you more. I think you better go back and see how the game is played because uh, two runs is nothing nowadays. And uh, as they say, a, boop and a, a bloop and a blast, and, and the game is tied. So yeah, he's trying to get on base to get his run, team some more runs. And for Colby Lewis to go off on this and saying that it's unethical and it's not the way you play the game, to me, he does look like a complete idiot and a fool. Yeah, that's kind of a, <laughs> kind of a rough... Uh way to go about uh, judging how the game is played by him uh, and of course a lot of baseball players have this uh, sort of unwritten rule type of stuff about them uh, and uh, piling on runs and things like that but yeah in a close game like that you would think that anything is fair and for years I've always said that when the shift was on Ryan Howard all he should do is lay out his bat and let the ball trickle into uh, past third base because there was never anybody there. Exactly, exactly. But, and if a team is going to shift on you because you're hitting it to one side or another and you uh, actually just hit it to the one side where they're at, what's wrong with that? I don't see a problem with it. Exactly, and that's the point. And, he, and, and as you said, the game was not – there is an unwritten rule, but the unwritten rule is if you're leading by 10 to nothing or – Eleven to one, or fifteen to two, or something like that. Then, then you would say, then you'd raise your eyebrows and say, "Hey, come on, you know that's not. This is a two nothing game." Or, or uh, I'm not really sure what the score was, but he, they were ahead by two runs. But even if it was four to two, or or three to one, or whatever, it was only a two run game, and you always try to add on runs. It wasn't a blowout by any means, and for him to get annoyed at this was just total uh, lunacy. But uh, he did, and and uh, got some coverage, and not all uh, good. Yeah, I could imagine. Well, we'll have to see what happens with Colby Lewis. We'll see if any repercussions uh, come from that. Uh, this afternoon, we were talking a little bit before we started the show tonight, Gary, uh, talking about the home uh, plate rule and catchers blocking home plate. Well, this afternoon, I happened to be at a Phillies game, and for the first time ever, I really saw a, a perfect example of what the MLB rule is. And that is, if a catcher is blocking home plate in any manner, blocking the, the runner's path to home plate, then that runner should be called safe. And uh, this afternoon, and you'll probably see this on ESPN if you're listening to this show uh, on Sunday or Monday, but uh, Ryan Howard was out by probably 15 feet this afternoon he didn't realize that a fielder had the ball 
as he rounded third he came chugging uh, halfway down from third to home and the ball was already in the catcher's glove maybe 15 feet before he got there but simply because the catcher caught it in the line of uh, third to home uh, he was declared safe today so little uh, changes with baseball mean a lot and any other game that would have been an easy out for a team but uh, not this afternoon yeah, I you know they're having a lot of trouble with that the uh, that that particular call uh, because it is a tough one um, and like you say, what is he supposed to do? Where is he supposed to catch the ball? You know, you have to be in some kind of uh, a position, and if the ball is in this to the to the line, I I don't know. I guess you gotta run past the line and reach back and try to grab it. And, and yeah, You know what's going to happen? Somebody's going to get hurt reaching back. They're going to separate a shoulder or something to that effect, and then they're going to then they're gonna say, oh, that, that rule's not worth making it either. Well, yeah, that's exactly right, because the, uh, the call took a long time to be called safe by the... Uh, office in New York where they had uh, appealed to play, the Phillies did, and he was clearly out. He would have been out uh, by a mile, so to speak, but the call was made uh, three and a half minutes later by uh, the New York uh, center that uh, makes all these calls and MLB main offices, and they had to call him safe, even though they probably didn't want to, because he was literally out by a mile, but due to the fact that the catcher caught the ball in the path they had to call him safe maybe the idea is to draw a box sort of like hockey does with the the goalie where the the catcher has to be within this box to tag the player and if he's outside of that box then there's your rule <laughs> yeah. I don't know because you know I I, I mean if she's got it if the throws not in that area then he's got to just let it go by I mean I don't know. It's a tough, tough thing to to uh, to talk about. It really is a tough thing to legislate, and I don't know what the answer is. Yeah, it's going to be uh, a rule that's going to be debated for sure as we go down the line here, especially with playoff baseball. You know it's going to happen uh, during one of those games. But uh, you have another story, Gary. Uh, over 100 years old, uh, this person got to throw out a first pitch this past week. Yeah, it was uh, last Sunday. Um, Agnes McGee, who is 105 years old and uh, a San Diego Padres fan, threw out the first pitch. And uh, I, I just thought it was kind of a cool little story that uh, somebody that's been a fan for a long time and... Uh, uh, you know, they're honoring and recognizing a senior citizen, 105 years old, God bless her, and uh, got to throw out the first pitch at the Padres-Mets game in San Diego. And I just thought it was a terrific promotion that they did there. Yeah, it's not every day somebody can even throw a ball at that age, but uh, to throw a first pitch like that's amazing. Uh, what a great story out of San Diego, and as you said, I think baseball, as uh, time goes on, when they're having a problem attracting fans and things, uh, this afternoon at the, at the uh, Phillies game where I was at, there was a few uh, service people that were brought onto the field, and that always uh, uh, brings a happiness about the crowd, a lot of clapping and, and good feelings from them. Uh, so I think you're going to see a lot more of that kind of stuff from baseball as they try to become more fan friendly and uh, some of these cities that aren't doing too well in attendance are going to try to bring some folks back. And Rich, speaking of promotions, you had a story about a promotion gone a little, shall we say, awry? Yeah, yeah, and uh, how do you spell awry? A-R-Y-E? <laughs> I don't know, just don't ask the guy from the Rockies. <laughs> spell that A-W-R-Y, but yeah, that's what happened in Colorado. Uh, last night I was uh, monitoring the Twitter uh, traffic and uh, while I was watching a game, and of course, uh, as soon as something happens like that, it catches fire, and it was all over uh, 
Twitter. There was a lot of tweeting about uh, Troy Tulowitzki's jersey. It was a giveaway at uh, Colorado for the Rockies, and of course that's a nice gesture by them, but the only problem was all 15,000 shirts were misspelled. Uh, Tulowitzki's name, uh, they missed the T on that, and it was sort of like Tulowizki, W-Y-Z, so kind of embarrassing moment for them. Uh, the Rockies did issue uh, a tweet themselves just after uh, it became known that the uh, spelling was wrong, but as you said uh, before we started the show, don't they check these things three times before uh, they give them the green light? I would think when they come in, they would check them too to make sure, but you know, it's probably one of these things where you get a late delivery and, and you look at it uh, and it's it's a lot of letters. <laughs> you just look quick and yeah. uh, you think it looks okay and it goes out there. But I also, are they uh, going to replace if you kept your ticket stub or whatever? Are they going to give everybody a new one? or? I don't think so. I don't think that they announced that they were going to a collector's item on your hand for a while but uh, yeah, that happens. I know I was at a uh, giveaway one year uh, where it was uh, Mother's Day and they gave a blanket away of one of the players and the colors were off and it, there was a defect on it. I remember that much and uh, they did exchange the blanket. This was the Phillies a few years ago. Uh, they did exchange that blanket, but I haven't heard that the Rockies were going to do that with these jerseys. I guess it's a tough thing. It's hard work in those promotional departments. And, uh, yeah. But maybe we have to do a little promotional work here too now, Rich, and tell everybody about BaseballTalkRadio.com and all the fine shows that are on, on that network. Yeah, so if you want to listen to some shows just like the one you're listening to right now, if you're a big baseball fan, you want to go over to BaseballTalkRadio.com. It's where you'll find a lot of the latest and greatest uh, talk shows, independent shows about baseball. We've got the Atlanta Braves talk on there. There's a baseball PhD show, which is uh, entertaining. Uh, Baltimore Orioles-themed show, Brewtown Sports, which is uh, Mr. Brewtown, does those Milwaukee Brewers. Uh, Cardinals, Fantasy Baseball, of course, Gary's own Mets Musings. You can listen to Gary's show uh, right from there. Uh, the Marlins, the Phillies, of course, the one I do uh, with a co-host of mine, Jimmy, Jim Mulry, and all kinds of shows. There's a Phillies minor league ball uh, podcast there as well. They have some interesting guests, Japanese baseball talk, the Yankees, Giants and even the Twins. So stop on by BaseballTalkRadio.com and uh, give them a listen. You can hear a lot of great shows there. Certainly can and keep up on all the action all year long for whatever team you like. That's true. So uh, check them out. You can check out Gary and my uh, own site here for the show. It's MLBThisWeek.com. You can find our latest uh, shows there as well as our YouTube edition of the show. We do a uh, recording of it on YouTube uh, once a week so you can catch us on video and also our podcast gear. If you like podcasting and thinking about getting into podcasts, you can see some of the equipment that we use. We have links up there and if you purchase those items right from our links, you'll benefit the show. So uh, from time to time you'll see uh, me using different mics. Uh, I have the AKG tonight as you can see and uh, Gary is probably sporting his uh, mic there, the uh, Audio Technica if I'm not wrong tonight, Gary. Well, tonight I have the Heil. <laughs> oh, you got the you got a PR40? No, I got the PR20. I'm cheap. <laughs> oh. All right. Well, if this sounds appealing to you, stop by our website, uh, our podcast gear page. You can find out all the different uh, stuff that we use. And I don't even think we have a link to your uh, PR20 there, Gary. It's not a not a bad mic at all. Sounding good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I figured I'd try that one out for a while. Yeah. And uh, this past week, uh, the 
San Francisco Giants had some uh, bad news. They've announced uh, that one of their announcers has a muscle disease, Gary. Yeah, Mike Krukow, a longtime TV broadcaster, uh, has uh, uh, degenerative muscle disease called inclusion of body myostis. And uh, it isn't a fatal disease, but it can be physical, physically limiting and intensely stressful and moment, monumentally frustrating. Uh, of course, Krukow pitched in the majors with the Giants, the Phillies, and the Cubs and uh, lived a pretty robust lifestyle, liked to do things outdoors and whatever. Uh, and he can't really do that now, and uh, he has to rely on others and sometimes look awkward in public, uh, uh, even to the point of falling down at that part. And, you know, if you, sometimes you do that and you fall down and people think you had a few uh, adult beverages, perhaps. So um, that's why he decided to come out and, and not be uh, keep it a secret so everybody could know about it. And actually uh, uh, bring attention to the disease and maybe try to get some uh, research grants and whatever. And uh, the disease causes progressive weakness in the muscles of the wrist and fingers and the front of the th thigh and the muscles that lift the front of the foot. So right now there's no cure for it. But um, just a shame... Uh, to uh, have a robust person like that and to suffer from a de disease like this, but uh, he keeps working, and that's mainly uh, the main thing. And it's, it, it says here in the article that uh, Dwayne Kuyper, who's his uh, his broadcast partner, sometimes uh, carries his bags for him on the road, so he's getting uh, support from his friends and, and from the Giants, and that's a good thing. It's a tough thing to go through. I know a lot of the different major leaguers from time to time you hear that announced and uh, kind of gives you a, a good feeling that you want to stay healthy and, and try to, you know, stay on top of things, but some things you can't help, so our thoughts and prayers go out to him. And uh, moving on to our next story here, uh, we're going to do some reviews of uh, how some of the teams are doing uh, with the standings so far after a couple of weeks here after the All-Star break and in the American League East it's uh, Baltimore still holding the top spot three games over the Toronto Blue Jays uh, the Detroit Tigers are still leading out there in the AL Central five games up on the Kansas City Royals uh, Oakland A's still in the driver's seat, although the Angels seem like they're uh, trying to make a charge at them every now and again. They're a game and a half up on the LA Angels out there in the AL West. Yeah, they certainly are, and uh, Royals trying to put a charge together for the, uh, the Central in Detroit, but Detroit's pretty comfortable there. And uh, the National League keeps flopping back and forth, though. So, Washington broke out a little bit from the pack. They now have a two-game lead over the Braves in the NL East, and then the Marlins and the Mets, and and your Phillies bringing up the rear there. Uh, and the Brewers that the Mets just split a series with, they're still hanging on to first place by two games. Uh, over the Cardinals, three and a half over the Pirates with Cincinnati, and the Cubs uh, behind at that point. The Cubs are, are literally out of it. Dodgers and the Giants, only a half game separate those two and uh, the uh, rest of the group. But that's a two-man race out there. Padres, Diamondbacks, and Rockies are double figures back. So they're not going to count. But that giant Dodgers is going to be uh, a race, I think, down to the wire. I think the Central is going to have an interesting race. And, and the whole National League, if you look at the numbers, is going to be a tight one all the way uh, for the rest of the season. Yeah, even some of these teams that are sort of on the edge, they're still not too far out of it. Uh, talking about Cincinnati, they're six games out right now. Uh, Pittsburgh, they go through some hot streaks now and again. They're only three and a half games back of Milwaukee and also St. Louis there. 
and even your mighty Mets. They're eight and a half games out, but you know who knows if they can make a trade uh, as the trade deadline uh, comes to play here within the next couple of days. You never know. It's just one or two players might make a big difference. Uh, the Marlins are still in there. They've won their last four. And all a team needs to do is get on a 7, 8, 9, 10 game winning streak. And they could be finding themselves back in this race, uh, regardless of which team. And of course, uh, as you said, the Cubs are way back. To a certain extent, the uh, Rockies are 14 games back. The Phillies are now 12 and a half games back. But if they can somehow turn it around and win 7, 8, 9, 10 games, they could rise up in the standings. You never know. It's just... Uh, a lot of time left here as, as we're getting into uh, almost August here. And, of course, these teams will have to start doing something to make it happen. But uh, I've seen it happen before. Oh, yeah. And with games in their division, they can always make it happen. Uh, um, that's, that's, that's the good part, that they still have games left in their division partners. And uh, uh, they can still be in a race and have a chance to make up a lot of ground but you know you got to take it one game at a time and just win that's it and uh, we'll take a look at the wild card standings real quick um, the LA Angels uh, for the American League uh, they're up eight games in the wild card standings if the uh, uh, if the standings uh, the season ended tomorrow the Angels and the Blue Jays would be in it uh, right now. Uh, over in the National League, it would be a tighter race. Uh, the Giants, uh, the Braves, and the Cardinals would be in it. So wild card talk. I know it's uh, kind of a far way away to talk about this, but uh, it makes it a little interesting, especially with that uh, extra wild card uh, that they have into the mix. <coughs> Well, it is a ways, but, you know, when you think about it, Rich, there's only, uh, I, as far as the Mets go, I think there's only 57 games left for the Mets. So uh, most of the teams have played 104, 105 games already. So it, it's really time to really start looking at that uh, kind of stuff. And uh, just before you know it, it's going to be gone. And uh, we uh, the playoffs will be here, and uh, we'll have our first season uh, of MLB uh, uh, doing the playoff hunt. So uh, it, it's coming quick. Yep. As is the end of our show, uh, we have a couple more stories to bring up. And, Gary, I just found this story last night after I sent you a list of uh, stories that I wanted to talk about tonight. But uh, an interesting story over in uh, Japan, I believe, uh, a team has found a novel way to fill the seats out there. And believe it or not, if the fans show up, they actually have robots out in the, in the seats, taking up the seats to uh, simulate fans being in there. So I thought that was an interesting uh, uh, thing to bring up on this show. <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> yeah, they have... Uh, robots, believe it or not, where you can upload your own face, your picture to it. You can control the robot in from your home on the computer if you can't make it to the stands uh, and the stadium, of course, to watch the game. But uh, it's pretty interesting. I, I imagine it's for a fee that you can do that. But they have a certain number of robots that will uh, occupy seats, and then you can subscribe or pay money to. Uh, either make them move or you know have your own face on their screen so very interesting uh, what happens with baseball overseas there can you uh, do the game through them i believe you can also watch the game uh through a a portal online as well and you can control the robot uh whether he uh, applauds or boos or whatever <laughs> Whatever happens, uh, you know, I'm not sure exactly what they can do with them, but uh, there was a whole host of things that uh, people could do if they couldn't make it to the ballpark, which uh, would mean that their their robot was at the ballpark, you know, through them. So, very interesting uh, story there. 
Well, that'll cut down on the lines at the concession stands and, and the and the restrooms. Yeah, you, you can imagine the players' uh, reactions from out on the field, you know, <laughs> watching a bunch of robots. But <laughs> leave it to the Japanese or uh, someone over there uh, overseas to come up with that one. <laughs> Great idea. Yep, and your story uh, last... Uh, kind of feeds into the hot stove here as we've only got uh, three or four more days of this uh, for the non-waiver trades and not so far not too active. I think we're going to see a lot in the next couple of days though. Yeah, the Padres seem to be the most active. They've traded away uh, two key players of their team actually. Uh, they traded Houston Street to the California Angels for uh, they got some nice prospects from California. Some of their top prospects. And also they traded uh, um, Chase Headley, who was terrific a couple of years ago. Um, they traded him to the New York Yankees for uh, a flash-in-the-pan third baseman that the Yankees were saying at the beginning of the year was the next coming of Cleet Boyer and uh, Babe Ruth rolled into one, uh, if you listen to the sports talk in New York, and then he eventually... Uh, the pitchers learned how to pitch to him, and then uh, he went from second in the league in hitting in April to about uh, 3,000 in second <laughs> now. Uh, but then in a couple of other prospects, uh, they traded for uh, Chase Headley. So Yankees trying to patch something together. Don't think it's working very well, but uh, uh, they also, uh, they've probably been the busiest to the Yankees because they acquired uh, McCarthy from uh, Arizona so far and uh, signed, I believe they signed Chris Capuano. Uh, he made his uh, debut yesterday, I believe. And uh, besides that, the Angels, I guess, getting uh, smarter before the uh, break. So uh, there's some teams that are active. I think some teams, you know, Rich, you was talking before about the wild card and that second wild card, and I think it really delays the, what people are trading. And, and I just wonder if they're going to consider moving the trade le deadline back to maybe the middle of August now because with more teams involved in a race, um, you may want to make it later. So... There's more deal wheeling and dealing that could take place and team fall out of the race. And, uh, yeah. It should be interesting to see, though. We have, four, like you said, uh, a few more days uh, until the deadline, and, and it's either going to be very hairy this week or very quiet and hairy on the last day. And, and then, of course, you can still trade the uh, waiver deals, and they, they you know, there's a lot of wink wink deals on that where people let players go by and mm -hmm. yeah it'll be interesting to see uh, some of the teams that are in the race so far really haven't made a move uh, and there's plenty of free agents available for that but no big names uh, really as you said Chase Headley is probably a, a guy that had should have been moved a couple years ago but uh, still the Phillies have a couple pitchers that maybe the Yankees or someone else are looking at. It'll be interesting to see uh, how much they want to revamp their uh, team. And uh, some other teams are rumored to be buyers as well. So I have to take a look and uh, see in the last couple days here as the clock ticks away towards this uh, trade deadline and see what happens with it. I think it's going to be a, sort of a furious couple days there. And the Phillies are really in a big spot to really try to uh, revamp that team. They've got a couple of pitches that I think teams will be interested in. The only thing that I see is, like, you take a team like the Yankees, what do they really – I mean, the Yankees' farm system is bare right now in the upper levels. They may have some good prospects down in the lower levels, but – the Phillies, uh, I don't think they would want that so much. You, you do want some higher prospects. And so I don't know if they're a good match, and I really mm -hmm. don't know who, who's a good match. You know, um, a lot of these teams have been winning, and some of them may not have a, a, a decent enough farm system remaining because they've dealt over the last few years. So 
Uh, it, it should be interesting. There's a couple of teams out there that we'll see. And as you say, uh, the, Mets, uh, the Mets also have some pitching uh, excess that they could uh, try to uh, put together a package for somebody. And excess in the middle infield is uh, so. It's going to be a crazy couple of days. We'll see what happens. Yes, indeed. We'll keep an eye on it for you, and we'll be probably talking about this a lot more on our next show. Uh, for now, this is uh, show number 19 of MLB This Week. And, Gary, another great week of stories and a uh, great show here. And I look forward to next week's show with you. Me too, Rich. So we'll be talking about the trade deadline. All right. We'll talk to you all next week on the next edition of MLB This Week.